Folks, I know many of us are wondering about the $1,400 stimulus check and whether or not President Biden is going to get it approved. Well, according to new data from the federal government, millions of people have actually benefited from stimulus checks last year. The two rounds of economic stimulus checks that were distributed over the course of six months appear to have semantically reduced financial hardship among many people and their households. According to new Census Bureau data, between April and December of last year, the rate of food shortages fell by more than 40%. During that same period, financial instability dropped by 45%. The sharpest improvements in food, security, and financial stability occurred in the weeks immediately after President Biden signed the bill. And the IRS began sending it out that week. So as part of a stimulus relief bill, the federal government distributed $600 to nearly every American adult starting in December of last year. Another bill, the American Rescue Plan, was passed in March, with another round of checks, this time for $1,400. Two groups in particular, everybody, experienced the greatest overall decline in hardship. That includes adults living with children and households making less than $25,000 a year. Starting last, July, starting last July, the child tax credit was distributed in the form of a monthly cash payment to families with children. $300 for each child under 6 and $250 for each child 6 to 17. Data shows that the checks alone will lift an estimated 10 million American children above the poverty line or closer to it. However, some critics say the payments distributed too much money to people who didn't really need it, and that it lacked any oversight of how the dollars were being spent. The overall cost to taxpayers of the stimulus checks was around $391 billion, but given the popularity of the stimulus payments and the growing evidence of their impact on people's lives, it is clear that a fourth direct check will be going out sooner. Many people, economists, are arguing that with unemployment still high, the, re the U.S. has a long way to recovery. That's why economists and lawmakers are now pushing for fourth round of checks. The good news is that it has been confirmed that the Biden administration and lawmakers are working hard to get this relief sent out. In addition, the IRS has announced that parents who added their child in 2021 could be getting up to $1,400 after they file their taxes, 21 tax, 2021 taxes this spring. But friends, let's not forget about this. The money will not come as a direct check, but with part of the overall tax return. So the third stimulus check was actually in advance on what is called the, 20, on what is called the 2021 Recovery Bay Credit. What that means is the $1,400 stimulus check that most people received would have gone, is the money they would have gotten after filing their taxes in the spring of 2022. So according to a new study, researchers predict the number of homeless seniors in New York City will more than double from 2,600 to 6,300 by 2030. In Boston, the figures projected a jump from 570 to over 1,500 over the next decade. So as the crisis continues, it is clear that, a con it is clear that Congress has to take action, more action for our seniors. And that's why the Senior Citizens League is now fundraising to support its efforts to lobby Congress to support additional checks. To support additional stimulus checks of $1,400 as the crisis continues. The federal government previously sent out $1,200 direct payments to most people back in March 2020. Then in December 2020, Congress approved additional checks of $600 to most Americans. Folks, do you believe that President Biden has to do more in helping out our seniors? Tell me what you think in the comments below. Joining us now is Marta Norton. She is America's chief investment officer at Morningstar Investment Management and Keith Lerner, co-chief investment officer at Truist. Uh, good to have you both here. Uh, Keith, I uh, wonder if you can uh, get us started with, with the kind of uh, field position you see uh, that stocks might have right here. S&P 500 closed down 10 percent from its high. We've been mired in this area uh, for more than a month right now. Corrections are routine, but the circumstances surrounding this one maybe not so routine, given what's going on with some signs of systemic risk and, of course, the ge geopolitical situation. Great to be both uh, with you, Mike, and, and uh, Sarah again. Uh, that's that's right. I mean, as far as the market, we've been in a, in a range about. I think this week, even though the headlines have been very negative, at least domestically, the S and P is only down about one percent. So, in some ways, I think that's actually relatively good relative to the headlines. But we see overseas markets down ten percent. This really reinforces our longstanding U.S. Uh, equity overweight. And then going to you more specifically to your question, Mike, about field position. Listen, I think it's going to be choppy waters here near term. I think the downside, that 4,100 level, that was around an 18 PE for the market, one of the lowest um, uh, valuations we've seen since the pandemic started. And then on the upside, I think the upside's likely capped around 4,600 and will likely continue to have a, a tug of war near term. 
as we get later into the second half, as we start to see some of these inflation trends hopefully come down, even though this situation complicates things, I think we'll likely have more of a push to the upside. But again, I think near term is more of choppy waters. Uh, just, uh, just as a quick follow-up, over the last week on a, on a sector standpoint, to reflect those choppy waters, uh, we've been overweight energy the whole year, but we also upgraded uh, consumer staples, which is still um, underperforming by about 30 percent since the pandemic, so have lagged. And we upgraded utilities from underweight just to have a little bit more of a balance in from a portfolio structure. Marta, uh, so many moving parts to uh, for an investor right now. If you've got an asset allocation strategy, right? Bonds are down on the year. Yes, they rallied this year. Commodities racing ahead. We do have a lot of these very fast-moving macro factors uh, in a portfolio that maybe has hit more bumps than we got used to in the last year or so. So, what do you think are the most relevant? decisions an investor should be uh, looking at making right here. Thanks, Mike. You know, I think one of the top concerns for investors right now is just panic. We have enormous amounts of terrible news, you know, around the world. And we also have concerns around inflation and what rising rates could mean. And this comes on the heels of a really strong market environment that has, you know, something that we've benefited from year over year over year. And so I think the concern is that investors who, who certainly just aren't as used to any major volatility or negative news could cut and run. And I think that is, you know, one of the worst strategies we could have. Now, whether there are better areas to be in the market than others, I think that's certainly the case. And I think it's especially important that investors consider markets or asset classes that can move out of sync with one another. So though rising rates might be on folks' mind, you know, treasuries still have utility in a portfolio and they've been showing as much this week. So I think it's important to stay the course, but also to have a very robust portfolio on hand. Should you boost exposure to commodities or, or have we seen the move? And they're still reaching record heights, a lot of these commodities every day. Absolutely. So from Morningstar Investment Management um, standpoint, we've had energy exposure, particularly MLPs in our portfolio for quite some time. That hurt us in 2020, um, but certainly in this market correction, it's been a, a, a source of ballast for us. Now, we're revisiting the valuations there. It's certainly been a big move. So whether it's as positive going been no evaluation is going to be on its side in the same way that it's been. But it's certainly been an area that's more attractive than some of these tech areas um, that potentially could be more sensitive to rate increases. Keith, you know, just talking about the large cap growth area, back in, you know, 2020, uh, they had defensive properties, right? Fang was acting like uh, both defensiveness mm -hmm. and growth in a portfolio. They've lost that. Obviously, we've had this macro struggle, and they have not uh, really done much of anything except go down and valuations get compressed. You see that changing? Do you see the, them coming back into favor for any reason? You know, we still think um, within tech, we have to distinguish uh, kind of what you mentioned more on uh, what parts of tech. I, I do think the mega cap tech side is still somewhat attractive, given the big balance sheets, um, given the cash flow. And if we're going to have somewhat of a slower global economy and a somewhat slower U.S. economy relative